as the clock on the walls on that lost time, we'll uh, go by Shazia's uh, clock uh, watch here who may just tell me it's 10 o'clock, so everyone's happy. I'd like to get uh, our West of England Combined Authority meeting underway. And may I just say before we start, traditionally we'd always had a table at the front where we all sat. Um, always keen to be very much seen that all of the combined authority was sitting together because the combined authority is very much about all the constituent authorities and the chairman of the left. Um, as an old, uh, an ex <coughs> South Gloss councillor, I'm quickly aware of how some of the technology used to perform in this room, so I'm delighted we've got some new technology, but in the short term, I'm told uh, for us to be able to have the correct microphone layout, we need to sit here. So my apologies on that. I, I hope in the future we'll be able to be uh, all sitting a lot closer to make sure that we're very, very clear in how we're seen as a combined authority and working together. But nonetheless, a very warm welcome to everybody. Um, thank you very much to South Gloucestershire Council. Toby, please, as always, would you pass on our thanks to your officers and everybody else who makes us so welcome here in Kingswood. Um, and I'd like to kick off, if I may, by doing the usual introductions. So, um, delighted to welcome Councillor Toby Savage, Leader of South Gloucestershire Council and Deputy Mayor of Combined Authority, Councillor Dina Romero, Leader of Bath, Arthur North East Somerset, Mayor Marvin Rees, Mayor of Bristol City Council, and Professor Steve West, the Chair of our Local Enterprise Partnership. A very warm welcome to everybody and everybody who's been good enough to come and join us this morning. Um, before we just move on to the main items, uh, I'd like to draw your attention just to a couple of the usual housekeeping aspects. I'm advised that there are no drills, fire drills or emergency drills planned for today. So in the event of an alarm, please take direction from Zafostia staff uh, who will assist us with our evacuation. And please do not attempt to return to the building unless you've been instructed specifically by one of the official fire rooms. Um, as you can see, this meeting is being recorded. The recording will be available on our website following the meeting. If anybody has any concerns at all about being filmed and recorded, please would they make themselves known either now to myself and the cameraman or at any point when they're about to speak. Is there anybody at the moment who would like us to acknowledge that they would not be comfortable with recording? I can't actually see anybody saying so, but please, if you come to the point and you're not happy, please make sure you let uh, our friend who's operating all the equipment know. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, apologies. Everybody is present. So, for the record, there are no apologies. The next item on the agenda is item three, declarations <coughs> of interest under the Localism Act of 2011. May I just declare an interest, please, on item 15, recommendation 1. May I ask members if there are any other declarations taken? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to declare an interest in the same item, um, but re on recommendation 2. Thank you very much. Were there any other declarations, folks? No? In that case, please, we will move to item 4, minutes of our <coughs> previous meeting. They've been circulated amongst members, published um, in, on our website and for members of the public. Members of the committee, have we got any comments at all around the minutes? Are you happy if I sign in for the record? Okay. I beg your pardon, sorry, Dean, I thought I... Sorry. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that I think it's very important that uh, the public also are aware that uh, things like the the questions that were asked of them in the, certainly the last meeting and also on the, the, um, uh, the recording, the recording as well, even though they're not on the minutes themselves. Thank you very much then. In that case, members, I will sign the minutes for the record. I'm getting my papers shuffled here. Okay. There we are. <coughs> Perfect. Um, chosen announcements, I normally try to give a very brief update of just some of the things we've been doing since we last met. Um, 
we were really uh, keen to ensure that we got our local industrial strategy launched as quickly as we could. I'm delighted that with the support of our LEP members, combined authority members, many of the other business community, universities and other stakeholders, that we did formally launch our industrial strategy recently. Um, that is going to be a really important document for the way that, as a combined authority in the region, that we do develop. Um, it's really given us the opportunity to be very clear with a very, very detailed evidence base around the real strengths uh, and those unique aspects of our region that make us both successful at the moment that are going to be that real building block and strategy for us to continue our inclusive and clean economic growth for the future. A very, very important document and a huge amount of work went in from many organisations, not just the Combined Authority, the LEP, lots of businesses, universities and many other organisations were consulted and fed into that. So, huge piece of work. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm personally really excited about the fact that we've now taken over, uh, finally, our adult education budget responsibilities. We are now formally in that position where those powers, funding and future decisions have been devolved to us. This really does mean we can start genuinely building for the future in terms of the way our skills provision through that sector is going to be formed for the future. We've touched on the importance of the local industrial strategy and our business and skills plan, <coughs> so we've got a very, very clear vision of how we move forward in ensuring we provide the right skills for everybody across the region to benefit from our growth. Um, some of you may have uh, been to the 5G Harbour Festival event, which is a great success in Bristol, showing again how, as a region, we can bring innovation and new ideas and add that little bit extra that we do so well, both in Bristol and across the region. That was part of our multi-million pound smart tourism project, a real live test bed of how to bring new technology to bear to show all of our residents how technology is going to be able to make a difference to people's lives. And again, a really good example of how by using funding, bringing businesses, universities, combined authorities, and our local authorities together, we are a really, really strong case. Another real personal highlight for me was um, to celebrate 12 months of work from the Growth Hub that we uh, conducted an event at the Ashley Community Housing uh, event at Barton Hill Settlement. A remarkable day where we were able to show that we have an immense and diverse talent across the region and the way in which, again, as a combined authority, we're able to reach out and make real differences to people's lives. To and for me personally, it's always a huge thrill to be able to meet individuals who are benefiting from such inspirational work. Again, that's a collaboration between the combined authority and other partners to really start making differences. And another example of that, again, was the project called Widget, which uh, is Again, a government-funded piece of work that we were coordinating, the Women into Digital Jobs Education and Training. Again, wonderful experience to go and meet uh, residents, people from our communities who really benefited from the ability to have new streams of funding that are coming through that again are unable to specifically help individuals to meet both some of the challenges they face, but more importantly, help them develop some of those skills for the future. So initiatives like that are hugely um, encouraging for all of us and from my personal perspective a great thrill. I'm delighted to join Dina in Bath recently for one of the first of our Love Our High Street initiatives. Uh, again, a really exciting event. I think on that one, 35 different businesses took part, showed again how working together with Baines and we will do with our other Love Our High Street initiatives we can make some really interesting, exciting interventions. And I think that was a really exciting period. Thank you. Um, so, just some of the work that's been going on re across the region. It's always just nice to share one or two of those things with you. So, we'll move on now, if we may, to comments from the Chair of the Local Enterprise Partnership. Delighted Professor Steve West is with us. Steve, would you like to? Thank you, Thank you Tim. Um, I'm going to start just by saying that the uh, LEP is going through a refresh at the moment. Um, 
We met uh, last week and we have six new members and I'm delighted to say that those members have added to our diversity uh, in a number of ways, both gender and ethnicity, and we will continue uh, to make some more changes over the next uh, month or so. In January, we'll have, uh, I think, a complete balance in terms of gender on our board, and I suspect we'll be the first, one of the first LECs in the country to be able to achieve that. Uh, we've done it also in a way that allows us to bring new expertise onto the LEC, um, more diversity in terms of the industry sectors that can be uh, recognised and supported, and that alongside um, new members from our uh, unitary authorities has brought, I think, a very dynamic and energetic new LEC board uh, into the room. Um, as Tim said, we have now launched our local industrial strategy. Uh, of course, the hard work now begins because it is a strategy for all and it has ambitions within it which hopefully chime with the ambitions of unitary authorities uh, across our region. Um, we have to recognise that uh, that strategy uh, is for all. It's a strategy that requires us to do a lot of hard work to reduce some of the inequalities that we have across our city region. It is designed to try and, uh, as we've said, and as Tim said earlier, inclusive economic growth, sustainable and clean economic growth. And there are challenges that sit within that. We know that we have health, education and housing inequalities and poverty that we have to face up to across our city region uh, and the, the local industrial strategy provides a framework within which we should be able to make progress there. As Tim said, a very important part of that is skills and how we equip not just the future workforce but our existing workforce to be more productive and to be able to face the challenges that we all uh, are having to face up to. There are a number of actions and themes that sit within the industrial strategy, um, some around innovation, cross-sectoral innovation, inclusive growth as I've just touched on, the productivity challenge that we all face in our organisations and of course how we can be innovative in the way in which we create new infrastructure. A theme that sits across everything within that industrial strategy uh, relates to clean growth, the research evidence in respect to global climate change uh, is very clear and evident and we need to play our part uh, as we consider the investments that we wish to make over the future um, in a way that balances our need to grow our economy and provide housing alongside the impact that that might have uh, within our environments. The industrial strategy of course isn't just about what we do in our region, we, our geography um, means that we have many other local enterprise partnership uh, uh, colleagues in other uh, parts of our, uh, uh, across the southwest. So when we look at the evidence base, it's very clear that we need to work in partnership with others in order to ensure that we have a vibrant uh, economic region that has impact uh, in a positive way for all parts. And of course, that will mean partnering with Swindon, Wiltshire, Gloucestershire, um, and uh, into other geographies in the southwest and across into Wales for specific projects where we identify benefit. We have to be ambitious, uh, and this is a long term plan and it's a strategic plan. I'm delighted that we have something that can act as a framework for us to go forward. There is a lot of work that started already, which is fantastic. Um, but there's a lot more to do and we will also be working very hard to reach out to communities so they understand what this means for them. Uh, it cannot be a document that just sits on a shelf, it has to be a lived uh, uh, document and it has to have meaning for all of our communities. The LEP has also been looking at some of those investments, the One Front Door uh, investment through the Local Growth Fund um, was also discussed. Um, what we've asked for is uh, a high level of scrutiny in terms of the investments that we've already made and the tracking and progress against those investments. Importantly, what we're looking for is where there are risks, are we managing those risks appropriately, uh, where programmes are slipping or if they begin to slip, what uh, possible actions can we take and um, if need be, how can we perhaps move projects from one area to another to ensure 
that we don't disadvantage ourselves and see funding having to go back to central government um, in March 21. Um, I think the LEP um, is keen uh, also <coughs> to begin to think through how we use the basis of the industrial strategy with our unitary authority partners and their strategic plans to begin to promote our city region, not just locally, but nationally and internationally. And I think that we will be working hard to reach out to communities so they understand the full opportunities that sit within the local industrial strategy. So I think that's it in a nutshell, Chair. Um, and we look forward to working, obviously, with all of our partners to deliver what we hope will be an ambitious and bright future. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And again, can I just um, echo on Sean on behalf of everybody, our personal thanks to you for the incredible amount of work you do through the LEP in supporting the region, but, but also please passing on our grateful thanks to all the other business board members, again, many of whom put a huge amount of time in on a voluntary basis. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, in that case, please, we will now move on to the comments from the Chair of the Combined Projects Overview and Scrutiny Committee. I'm delighted Councillor Clark's able to join us today. Yeah, the comments have been circulated to Councillor Clark, as you know, but very welcome just to, to, to hear more from you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as, as you know, the timings of our meetings sorry, have been excuse organised. Excuse me, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> would you mind, would you mind grabbing the microphone and pressing the button on the right? That way it's in on all everybody's moves and so on. Oh, I see. Sorry. Oh, okay. Good, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you know, we, we've timed our meetings um, to enable us to look at the papers for these meetings as well so we can comment on those. <coughs> Excuse me, as well as have our regular items for consideration. Um, it means we can only take a, really quite a, a, a quick look at them, but nevertheless, we have, we have looked at them. Um, so a couple of items I'll, I'll pull out. Um, the, um, the Future Bright programme, we're very keen on the Future Bright programme. We think it's an excellent programme that helps lots of people with, um, who are very disadvantaged. We had a presentation um, where the officer was talking about helping people uh, with mental health difficulties and a relatively high proportion of people um, within this programme who, who have mental health problems. So we would, we would recommend that this is, is supported, this programme is, is supported. We support the full business case um, for Future Bright Plus and in the longer term we had various suggestions that we could look at other ways of raising money for this programme, perhaps uh, involving combining with um, working with charities, for example. So to think about longer term, um, to think about this programme longer term. Um, the procurement uh, issue on your agenda item 13, um, we welcomed the report. We think it's a good idea to uh, procure it in this in this way. Um, one thing we thought was missing is the SME spend is talked about quite a lot. Um, there's no mention of the word local in the, in the document. And um, we, we've done quite a bit of work on this in Bristol. And while I want to support SMEs in, uh, in Newcastle or Stoke or whatever, I would like to particularly support SMEs within the region. And we would ask perhaps that that, that word is inserted and um, is included within the process. Uh, the business plan, um, we, we read this and perhaps it's an oversight, but it doesn't seem to be updated to reflect the issues around the JSP and the problems over the JSP. Um, it, it rather reads as if it was written before any letters had been received from the inspectorate. So, I mean, that clearly is, is a risk and should be treated as a risk within the corporate risk register. Uh, remuneration panel. Um, one of our members thought quite strongly that you weren't paid enough. Um, uh, and the suggestion was that, um, that going forward, the, um, the pay should be attractive enough to, uh, um, to attract people, the right people to do the job. 
um, and that was felt quite strongly by one member and a couple of other members, I think, agreed with that. Um, we thought that your pay should be compared with uh, the other combined authority mayors, um, and we're not sure whether that process actually happened. I mean, we do recognise that the uh, remuneration panel met at short notice and did a relatively quick job. Um, another point we had, uh, and um, uh, we thought perhaps that the chair of the scrutiny committee and the chair of the audit committee should get some kind of allowance within the uh, within the remuneration panel uh, within the the committee. Um, and I, I understand from Shazia that there's going to be discussions about that going forward, which we welcome. Um, one more thing, the last thing. Uh, the public speaking at these meetings, we've, we've raised this before, but it, it doesn't seem to have made it into the rules. But we do think that when the public asks a question, um, and the question is answered, that they should be allowed then, as is the case in Bristol, um, they should be allowed an extra question, a supplementary question. Um, and we felt quite strongly, actually, we've raised it on a number of occasions, we felt quite strongly that this should be incorporated into the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Clark. I, I won't make any comments about remuneration, but uh, uh, <coughs> either for anybody in this role or in yours. But uh, I think that's the importance of having an independent panel on that part. But in terms of the aspect around the SMEs, thank you for raising that. It's, it's a very good point. It, it, it is being addressed and will be written in. Um, and I'm hoping and I, I'm looking to my other council or the other council leaders and, and Marvin, I believe that will be the case again through other authorities in terms of procurement. So I think that's very important. And you're, you're right about uh, strategy in terms of updating around things like spatial plans and so on, reflecting changes in it. So they're all points very well made. And thank you all again for both your hard work and please for the other members of the committee. Thank you. Item 8 is comments from the combined authority boards. Um, following our recent constitutional governance changes, um, there are now four newly established boards that have all held their first formal meetings uh, during the last month. Um, just to remind everybody, those boards are dealing specifically with planning and housing, with transport, uh, with business and skills. So planning, housing, transport, business and skills, and they're all attended by the relevant cabinet members from each of our authorities, plus our officers and myself. Specific comments from each of those boards about the items on today's agenda have been circulated to all the members and we'll be considering those as we are looking at our decisions. So please, that's just to acknowledge the hard work that goes on there and where those comments feed into our decision-making process. In that case, please, we'll move on to item nine, which is items from the public, cover questions and statements. Um, so, where will we start? Questions, there were four questions submitted for the meeting, and as is usual, that each of those questioners have received formal and written responses. We have 13 statements. So each of those has been received, thank you, and circulated to the members. Um, statements give everybody the opportunity to talk to the committee for up to three minutes. There is um, an allowance within this meeting for 30 minutes, please, along that line. So Shazia is very efficient with her stopwatch. Please, I would ask you to respect uh, when I give you a, a reminder of your time and please I'd ask you not to overrun. It's not fair on everybody else. So please, can we think about how we're all working collectively in that vein? So we will run through the list of statements in the order in which we have received them. Um, I don't think I can see him. I think it would be fairly <coughs> obvious if Councillor Weston was here, for those of us that know him. Uh, I can't see him, but the first statement was from Councillor Weston. As he's not here to comment, we'll move on to item number two on there, which was from Sandy and Mark. Are you going to talk yeah, individually? Or? Yeah. Okay? Beg your pardon? 
Could, could I ask that Lisa does her one first? And then I uh, she was down at number 12, but I don't mind if members are happy if we shuffle the orders. Yeah. Thank you. Please, please, would you look to Tim, just to your left, Lisa, who will explain how to do this. the right hand little button there. Thank you. Great. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate you taking the time to come and share your story with us and uh, talk to us regarding that. Thank you. Uh, if, if we go back to the sort of running order, technically that would come back to you, Sandy, if you'd like to yeah. talk to us again. As before, three minutes and we'll let you know in the 30 seconds to go. Uh, Good, thank you. I, I'd just like to contrast Lisa's story with the conversation that I had last night with a cameraman from Icon Films, um, who I was working with, uh, who has the dream job of uh, travelling the world filming um, wildlife in you know, Africa and, and Asia. Uh, I asked him how he got his job. Uh, he said, oh, my parents know the people who run Icon Films, so I've got work experience there, and hence he's built a career. Um, what we want to do with the court's development, which you'll see is on uh, Agenda Item 12, Recommendation 4, is to give people like Lisa um, the opportunity uh, that the cameraman has had, um, uh, which means that everybody, uh, regardless of, of your background, your talent can shine and you can make a career uh, in the creative industries. That's what we're aiming to, to do. And we'd like to do it for 580 young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. We think that that's what we can achieve with the courts uh, project. Um, the courts will also meet the evidence need for um, high quality inner city workspace for the creative industries. 
um, generating about £4.7 million pounds of GVA. Um, so far we've raised over a million pounds, I was pleased yesterday, we've got another £70,000 towards uh, the £2.2 million pounds of match funding that we need that will trigger an additional £4.3 million from the, um, from the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, we've, uh, we continue to apply for other uh, funds and we've got about £1.2 million pounds of applications in um, at the moment. But uh, we need to submit our uh, bid to the Heritage Lottery Fund by uh, the middle of November. Um, and to have a good chance of success, we need to have 80% of, uh, of the match funding uh, secured. So we acknowledge that the officers um, have set out and have not been able to recommend fully the funding for the project at this stage as you as the LEC and LECA don't have uh, the funds to dedicate to it. However, we are asking uh, that the Joint Committee consider underwriting um, up to £850,000 of uh, match funding to ensure that Bristol and the West of England don't miss out on the opportunity to draw down the further £5.5 million pounds, um, that this will bring uh, into the region. Uh, we will, of course, continue to fundraise over the next two years uh, during the court's development period, and so ultimately the underwrite may not be uh, required at all, um, but at the earliest it would be required by 2022. Um, so we are asking you, um, both the combined, seconds, combined uh, authority, and uh, I think we're coming to the Joint Committee after this too, uh, to underwrite the proportion of the funds necessary uh, for a project that will attract more than five and a half million uh, of England investment, support more than 100 jobs in the region, upskill more than 500 young people each year, and deliver more than £4.7 million pounds of GBA. Thank you for your consideration. Sandy, thank you very much indeed. Appreciate you coming along and talking to us. Um, my next in terms of order is Susan Davies. Sorry, Davies. Davis is right. Thank you. You're never quite sure, right? I know. You've already got a bit of each other. I hope you realise what the form is. Up to three minutes and we'll let you know in 30 seconds. Do you have to put anything on here? Hello. My name is Susan Davis. I'm a parent and a primary school teacher in London. <coughs> I'm also a member of FACE, which stands for Family Action on Climate Emergency. We are a fast-growing network of families and friends taking collective action to tackle the climate crisis. I am committed to educating my Year 5 class about the climate and helping them to understand what has happened and is still happening to their world in an age-appropriate way. But I also want to give them hope. Sadly, hope is in short supply. The world is burning. Sorry. The Amazon and even the Arctic are on fire. David Attenborough agrees that it is likely that the end of human civilization is in within, within their lifetimes. Sorry. Other than empty words for concern, there is little sign that leaders will make the necessary drastic changes. I want to ask you, do you think WECA can give us hope? I was delighted when I witnessed the climate emergency declaration at your last meeting in Bristol. But what does this mean for WECA? You can make a big difference but we need the climate emergency to be at the heart of every decision that we make. And we need ambition and urgency. Have you made a reference to carbon neutral by 2030 in your climate declarations like the councils you support? Are you serious about facilitating real change in the West of England? I'm not sure because I'm concerned that on your website you're upbeat about how well you have done so far alongside economic growth. And it worries me that this looks like business as usual. Thank you for the planned improvements to our public transport. We need more of this. WECA can really make a difference here. Both Bristol and Bath have illegal levels of air pollution, and across the region, around one third of our CO2 emissions are transport. <coughs> our priority should be to offer people a reliable, affordable alternative to cars. I'm concerned that on your website, WECA's investment in public transport looks small compared to your millions of pounds investment in driverless and low emissions private cars. I urge you to take your responsibility seriously. Do you really, as you say, recognise the challenge and threat posed by the current climate emergency? Because if you do, you will invest in education for green jobs rather than lending your support to the growth of Bristol Airport and its devastating environmental impact. You now have the power to make a meaningful difference. More and more people now know about WECA and are looking to you to fund the changes that are needed. 
The Green Party had the most votes in Bristol in the EU elections. Another 30 seconds, please. This area wants a proper, ambitious and urgent climate emergency intervention. Please do it. I want to believe it when I tell my pupils that there is hope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sheila, is there anything you'd like to say? Yes, I, I just wanted to ask the speaker um, if she was aware that, sorry, I've gone red, I'm a special group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're fine. Um, whether she was aware that WECA will be uh, looking to embed um, the climate emergency within their decision making oh. um, uh, processes in the future. I'm not sure who the speaker sorry. knows. So, could you just find pressing the button? Thank you. So rather than have a perhaps a, a dialogue going back and forward, perhaps we could just take Councillor Romero's comment if uh, Susan's interested uh, regarding. Thank you. I mean, we're trying to address your point. So Sorry, Councillor Romero is trying to. Yeah, Councillor Romero is just trying to Sorry. explain to you that yes, we are looking at how we make sure we embed this in the work we're doing. So please, just wanted to make that point through through Councillor Cant Romero. Uh, and I'm very keen for, for Marvin to, to add any thoughts as well, please. So, um, it's one of the, I mean, this is a, an adult kind of conversation back and forth about this, obviously. Um, so, we've got to look at the full range of challenges and follow the evidence. Uh, one of the things that we're contending with, having done an audit on Bristol, is that about 36% of our, our carbon emissions are housing related. Um, we are in the process of building uh, 33,000 homes in Bristol over the coming. Uh, uh, 17 or so years, um, and obviously over 100,000 homes across the patch. Now, so one of the things that would be incredibly helpful of us actually as we think about how we physically lay out the city and the kind of homes we bring forward actually bump into challenges that as well as uh, targeting authorities, and that's really important, we get involved in a public debate. Because invariably, as cities face the challenge of needing to build centrally, more densely and higher, which are the three uh, characteristics of urban development that we need to do if we can minimise the carbon price we pay for a rapidly urbanising world, that runs into blockages and that runs into tensions and public debates and we've got discussion across the backs from the, the, the Twitter wars and, and so forth that go on. So I'd really uh, welcome um, engagement, and I've said this to members of Extinction Rebellion, I'd really welcome engagement in some of those debates about how many houses we build, where we build them, and the kind of houses we build as well. That, that the legacy of that will be with us for centuries, but certainly over the next, uh, certainly over the next decade as well. Marvin, thank you very much. So, I just wanted to make sure that members have had the opportunity just to, to come back to you with a couple of comments. Thank you. In that case, please, the next person on our list was Mr. Thomas. Is Mr. Thomas here? Uh, Mr. Roberts. Uh, uh, Henry Byrne. Uh, Dave Bridgewell is the next on our list. I can't see Dave. So, because Dave's not here. Christina, thank you. You're on the list shortly, so we'll come uh, to you. Dave's asked me to speak to the statement. No, no, the statement's been received from Dave. So, uh, the, the correct process, as you know, is you're on the list now, so you'll be able to shortly talk on that. Um, I understand Dave hasn't been enjoying the best of health, so as he's a, a good friend to any of us, I'm sure you'll join me in wishing you well in the future. Uh, Mr. Bray. Mr. Bray with us. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you understand the form now. Three minutes to let me know in the yeah, thank you. Um, at its meeting on the 19th of July 2019, the West of England Combined Authority declared a climate emergency. As a Bristol resident, I wholeheartedly welcome this important move. To take effective action to address the climate emergency we all face will be difficult and challenging for Wecker. The easiest and most cost-effective first step in tackling the climate emergency is to ensure that no new sources of greenhouse gas emissions are developed or existing sources expanded. Bearing that in mind, will WECA do all in its power to oppose any expansion of Bristol Airport, which, if allowed, would significantly increase greenhouse, 
greenhouse gas emissions in that sector and run counter to Weather's declaration of a climate emergency. Those who support the business case for airport expansion may argue that growth in the sector is inevitable, but this is not the case. Aviation is increasingly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, for example, severe weather patterns, disrupting schedules, and the increasing costs of mitigating these challenges. This, together with consumers choosing other forms of transport out of concern for the environment, make the business case for expansion much less robust. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, James. Christine. I, I beg your pardon, because, sorry, I did look around, I didn't see any comments earlier, but Demon, sorry, do you have a comment to the earlier gentleman? Well, I, it, it's sorry. to him, but also to us as well. And I think there is a, a bit of a conundrum here, because certainly Barcelona Somerset has expressed um, an objection to the airport expansion. Um, I, I don't know, I, must admit, I don't know how the other authorities within WECA have, um, whether they have responded uh, similarly or not. But how does that square then <coughs> if WECA have uh, not just um, not made any statement but actually have welcomed the expansion? And I wondered you know, how we need to address that particular issue. So it's a combination really to you, um, Mayor, plus also to the gentleman to the speaker too. Okay, I, I was, uh, there are a, a number of aspects of this that have been discussed, as you said, at previous combined authority meetings. Mm -hmm. Very happy for us to pick it up at the next Mayor, Mayor's and Leaders meeting. Tony, please, then Steve. Um, thank you, Chair. I think uh, I, had, I was able to um, uh, meet with Airbus um, earlier this week because I'm very conscious that, that when we talk about the future of aviation and aviation growth, just how many uh, tens of thousands of jobs um, uh, that the people in South Gloucestershire are reliant upon um, working within that industry. And I think what's particularly exciting with Airbus and Rolls-Royce it, it is the progress that they are making uh, towards um, uh, introducing electric engines um, into uh, our, our aircraft of the future. Um, so not only are we able to protect and support that industry, but also to support it to move towards a lower carbon future. Um, and I think that a lot of the issues that we hear about today, I think, is, is just recognising that we can perhaps always do a better collective job of explaining all the things that we're doing that we need to support. And also one of the... Um, one of the um, proposals that, that we will be considering um, is around the Digital Engineering Technology Institute and actually how we support um, uh, our, our highly valued um, engineering companies like the aerospace industry um, you know, to ensure that they are fit for the future um, and able to support our transition towards a, a lower carbon community whilst protecting existing jobs and generating additional jobs. David, thank you. Steve. Thank you, Chair. I, I think um, what I want us to try and ensure is that we look at this um, challenge, and it is a global challenge. Let's just remind ourselves this is a global challenge, and we need to be acting locally in order to try and support the endeavour. But we should also be very clear that it's about putting pressure on, on governments across the globe to engage with this particular agenda and balance how we can best move forward as a whole and use the evidence base that is available to us. Marvin, I think, makes a very important point. And that is that we know our current housing stock and any future housing stock will have a huge impact. And therefore, as we're looking at how do we become carbon neutral, every decision that we make, it's not just about picking off one or two areas. It is about looking holistically at how can we best manage our carbon footprints going forward. That's about looking at what we already have and what we might be developing and moving forward on. So I think we've got a lot of work to do. It's not going to be easy, and we need to follow the evidence to ensure we make the right decisions on the way. And inevitably, there are going to be some difficult moments where we are going to have to trade off and make compromises, because at the end of the day, we do have to ensure that we've got jobs for the future, that we've got people in employment who can make a living and survive.
So I'm just asking us to be sensible as we look at all of the areas we need to consider when we're looking at the global challenge in terms of climate. Thanks, Steve. Pardon, any other thoughts? I actually, I actually welcome, and we can do this as kind of final authority. Um, let's actually um, put down the various uh, scenarios, um, including the impact of, uh, of the airport, and put some real numbers against them. And, and the various risks that kick into play, um, and, and like the outcomes of those risks, if those numbers come to fruition. I mean, one is I think it would be useful to look at uh, my response on climate uh, in Bristol, because you can see actually doing the analysis of where does the challenge come from, it's 36% housing, 33% transport, 30% non, non-domestic uh, non buildings. So the drivers uh, for Bristol are within that. So actually, again, I go back to, I think one of the big debates, uh, one of the big determinants of our regional impact on climate is going to be how do we build homes and where we put them, right? So, because it will set up lifestyle. What I'd really be interested in, the question I constantly ask people just to work through, and it's not saying where the numbers will go, but it would be good to put it in a paper. What happens, or what, are the, what, what risks or dynamics come into play if the numbers of people flying in the future go up and we haven't expanded a regional airport? That, so I, I, I think if the numbers of people going down, then, there's a, you know, then we've got some numbers that come out that actually inform with some numbers about where we should come. I think there are risks either way. But I think that getting some outside eyes, maybe with the climate advisory panel that we've put up together in Bristol, uh, would be a good place to go and get some numbers. Because I know there's a report saying, an article come out saying the numbers of people flying are going to go down. Um, you can also pull up a report here I got when on Forbes saying air travel projected to double in 20 years. So we have to kind of have a sense of what is the world going to be, not the way that we want it to be, what is the world going to be, and how do we best manage uh, the world in the way that it will be to minimise the harm uh, to the planet of that inevitable growth in global population, urban population, and international population. Dana, go on very quickly. Yeah, I just wanted to draw this panel's, uh, this committee's attention to the paper that's coming to our committee sunsets. Uh, council meeting next Thursday, which is on everything we are currently doing uh, to address the climate emergency, uh, which is not just everything the council is doing, but everything partners and all residents and businesses, etc., can do as well to, to play play their part. Um, and uh, unlike Marvin, our housing uh, stock is one of our uh, biggest contributors to um, uh, climate emergency. So I think it's something like sixty of our uh, emissions go through our housing, which actually means that, and that's partly because we've got such old housing stock and we need legislation, etc., to play its part in helping us address um, our challenges too. So it's, it's you know, I was just making the point that it's not just about the work we can do as WECA or even individually within our local authorities, but it is also how we pull in the, the other powers. So some of that is our own um, legislation uh, in this country, some of it is also looking at what other uh, governments can do. But we also need to think, if we're not creating most of those emissions, are we inadvertently making a contribution? You know, where do your clothes come? Where does your technology come from? You know, how is that made? And we need to be thinking of that as well. Dean, thank you very much. I, I, I think what we're quite clear about there, and that's why I said it's something we'll pick up through, through mayors and um, chief execs and leaders again when we all meet. There's clearly a lot happening in that space, a lot, lot of really interesting thoughts. We'll work together on how we bring those pieces together. Barbara, any final thoughts? I just, say to, I just wonder if we, if we could collectively commit to kind of expanding. Uh, it's interesting your, your numbers on your housing stock, but maybe some of the work we've all done and just add that with North Somerset as well and look at scaling it up to look at that collective. What are the drivers um, across our patch and where do we need so we got some real um, common evidence. I think one of the real challenges is that I mean, people are coming from different places and having different sources of truth. Uh, what we need to do as, as best as possible is have a common understanding of what the drivers of our, uh, our climate impact on the climate are so we can agree what the priority actions uh, that are needed uh, rather than just going to very symbolic um, interventions, we need to fo follow the numbers. Right, thank you very much. So again, we'll pick all of that up and we'll meet again shortly. Thank you very much.
Christina, sorry to have invited you up and then pick back, go, going back to that one, I hope you don't mind. I think you know the form better than most, three minutes and we'll let you know. I, sorry, when I switch my button off, I'll tell you to go. <laughs> and we'll let you know after, when it's 30 seconds left. Thank you. Is that working now? Right hand. Right hand side, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Chair. Um, for the benefit of those who don't know, um, uh, my name is Christina Biggs. Um, the campaign lead for the Friends of Suburban Bristol Railways. Um, our vision is to use freight lines across the region and um, improve railway services because we think that rail is the existing rapid transit that actually exists right now and investing in rail is probably the best thing um, we think Wecker can do. We're very encouraged that Wecker are, are in fact progressing back to phase one and two. Um, as ever, we, we want more. Um, and, um, but today I just want to talk a bit about um, what to work for. Um, and we were so excited when Wacker was, was set up. And, you know, 30 million a year for 30 years, so you just like the dream amount of money. Um, and I think we're just a little bit apprehensive that, that the way it's, you've gone about it, and that we understand it's lots of money, we understand you want to spend it responsibly. Um, I, I, I happen to be chair of a charity, a very small and painting orchestra, and the one thing we really don't want are people giving money to us for certain purposes. So restricted funds are not actually a very good idea. We're then tied to, to, to and you seem to be doing that um, you know, in your question, in your question, answer to my questions today. Uh, you're saying, well, it's a transport levy, and that's not for socially necessary. I, I take that's buses. Um, and then this money is, is, is capital, it's not for revenue funding. I can see you know, the sense in, in trying to be disciplined about how you use your funds. But, but the problem is, the background is that the local authorities, their, their money are being stripped by austerity. So your, people are taking away the capability of, of, of Marvin and you know, the, the big cities, um, the local councils, to run stuff themselves. They're taking that money away by austerity. And then they're saying, but look, here's this extra money at Wecker. This is extra money. And, and it's not, because it's restricted. So you know, you're not allowed to do a bus subsidy at the moment. Um, and I would also say, rather than just spawning additionality for me, wouldn't necessarily just be spawning extra projects. So, you know, there's digital women into digital skills. That, that sounds great. Speech of Bright, that sounds great. But then you've got, you know, wonderful arts project coming up, uh, for one, wanting money for something they've actually thought out themselves. And, uh, you know, it, I'm hoping you're going to allocate money to, to projects that come forward um, that, that do that have that benefit across the region. 30 seconds, please. Yeah, so the other thing is that, you know, neither of you are sort of doing that. So Dave Redwell, you know, wonderful guy, he's, he's come up with all these things that you could be doing on the ground with buses, and you don't seem to be wanting to do that either. Um, and looking forward in rail, you're looking at existing corridors, you're not looking at new stations, which we badly need. So, you know, we love you, we, we want you to do really well, um, and we just want to encourage you to, to be bolder here. Thank you. Two, two seconds out from being spot on. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, the next person on my list is Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams hello. Again, okay, just uh, you've seen three minutes, and we'll let you know when you have 30 seconds left. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Thank you very much for um, giving me the space to speak. My name is John Adams, and I'm uh, rather against my will. I run something called Stop Bristol Airport Expansion Campaign. Um, brief personal background: I moved to Bristol in 1979. Since when uh, I've been involved very much in the creative industries in Bristol. I was employed largely by um, the Arts Department in Bristol University. I was a founder member of the Watershed Media Centre and I've worked closely with a number of regional media production companies and local theatre companies, particularly startups um, developed by students in our department. I thought I'd retired, but I simply cannot uh, stay in retirement when there is such a huge issue facing us. Um, I've submitted a statement, uh, which I'm afraid is rather long, but I beg you please to take time uh, to read it. Uh, the current points I wanted to make, I've thrown away in the light of what I've heard this morning, so I'd just like to give 
a response to some of the points that have come up. I think the first thing is that um, we, we do not think, uh, we, there was a call earlier on for evidence. We now think there is overwhelming evidence that Bristol Airport expansion cannot be justified at the present moment. We need to move in the direction of a sustainable airport, and that means an airport tied to the health and well-being of the communities, and also tied to technology. So we've got nothing against an airport, we need a sustainable airport, particularly where growth is concerned. I think in terms of figures um, and work, the, the Joint Spatial Plan has yet to consider Bristol Airport in any significant form. And the work position assumes economic uh, benefits to the west of England, while there is now mounting evidence that there will be very few economic be benefits. But what there will be is massive harm to local communities, and of course to, uh, when I say local communities, I include the communities of South Bristol, if expansion goes ahead, from a range of reasons that we're all fully aware of, uh, going from aviation, uh, uh, pollution, to uh, traffic fumes and parking. Another 30 seconds, sir. So what I would say is, uh, please will you consider, and I'd like to pick up on Mary's suggestion, to look at the numbers. Look at the consequences of the airport not expanding in terms of stranded assets, the waste of public investment. Look at the, uh, um, uh, the problems that of night flights, lifting night flight restrictions, and the harm to mental health will be given, and look at the damage that will be done to our habitat and environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alex. Um, Finally, Mr. Baxter. Baxter with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for everybody. Thank you for everybody who's come and joined us. For those that haven't, um, we'll say it have been submitted. They are with uh, all of the members, and uh, they, they will be shared for part of the minute. So thank you very much indeed. That takes us now on to item 10, which is petitions from any members of the combined authority. And it's, I can't see you coming forward with any, so I take it there are none. Thank you. In that case, please, item 11 is the combined authority of mayoral budget outturn report from April to August 2019. Um, so there are a number of aspects within that uh, that I think are just worth highlighting uh, in terms of appendix one for setting out the mayoral funds forecast revenue act and position for current financial year um, and that shows some overall spending of 1.231 million get it the right way around thank you so slightly higher than the revised budget largely due to some slippage on grant funded feasibility project as this slippage is funded by grants also brought forward, the net position remains balanced. It's an important aspect there. And Appendix 2 sets up combined authority estimated revenue at term position for the 1920 financial year, which overall is 5.006 million higher than the original budget due to slippage on grant funded feasibility projects, new funding approvals through the investment fund and an increase in specific grant funding. Uh, spend being fully funded from income and reserves. So the net position is forecasted as an underspend of 250,000 through achieving a surplus on investment returns. Just going to look to Charles Erian to make sure that I've interpreted the way those numbers were dealt earlier is correct. Thank you. <laughs> um, and Appendix 3, please, uh, outlines the current capital budget forecast for 1920 financial year. Also, no specific decisions required for this report. Uh, and it is for noting, just like to invite members if they had any comments they'd like to raise on this particular item. I see we haven't, therefore, as the item is for noting, i ask the minutes to record that they are duly noted. Item 12 is our investment fund report, um, and that's to remind members uh, that. You'll recall that our meeting in June, the committee agreed an overall budget funding off an envelope of some £350 million for the period up to March 2023. 
reflecting our strong ambitions to, to drive forward projects which will bring significant positive improvements and impact for our residents right across the region. Um, and within that context, the report before us today sets out details of the latest project-specific improvements uh, that we're looking for approvals on, including for business case for the Great Stoke roundabout capacity improvements, uh, future further allocation to support our future mobility zone bid, further funding to continue to progress the development work on the housing infrastructure fund between Bristol Temple Meads to Cainshall along the strategic growth corridor along the A4 and A37. Details of the Bath Riverside Land Acquisition Fund submission. Um, funding to help address the challenge of the lack of evidence and research around careers, education, information, advice and guidance. It's very important to help us to put, determine what are the appropriate interventions that could come forward to help us improve on that important challenge. Uh, funding for full business case uh, towards the Work for Everybody programme, which will help target people with learning difficulties to support them to achieve and maintain paid employment. Uh, further funding for Business Case to extend and develop the current Future Bright Innovation Pilot, which we heard about earlier. The report also updates on the work on our Talent Institute's initiative and seeks approval for a further £50,000 to progress the Work and Well Institute. And in line with current processes for managing reported scheme changes, Appendix, Appendix 8 sets out the latest change requests and Appendix 1 sets out the delegations for changes to schemes within the approved programme committee's agreement. Um, but with particular regard to the Quantum Technologies Innovation Centre project referred to in paragraph 29 of the report, Members will be aware that a supplementary note has been circulated providing an update on the due diligence work undertaken by Ernst Young, Young and this essentially satisfies the requirements set by the committee when we approved an investment fund allocation for this project earlier in the year in June. Accordingly, with the agreement of members, we need to formally add an additional recommendation to that which was published, which would read as follows. <coughs> to note the points to be addressed in contractual and monitoring arrangements with the University of Bristol for the delivery of the QTIC Plus, as set out in paragraph 5 and 6 of the supplementary note, and to delegate the approval of achievement of the conditions precedent to the combined authority chief executive in consultation with the chief exec of our constituent councils, with a further report to be presented to the committee should there be issues requiring a further decision. So, very happy to move those recommendations as set out in the report, together with the additional recommendation 11 as outlined. And I look for a second, please. Marvin, thank you very much. Members, can I ask you to make any comments around any aspects of the report or particular aspects of, of any of the uh, recommendations we've got? Toby, would you like to start? Um, thank you, Tim. I'd like to focus um, my comments around just a couple of the, uh, the recommendations. I wanted to start with the um, Great Stoke uh, Roundabout Scheme um, and to welcome uh, the funding that um, we're being recommended to approve today. Uh, the widening of, of, of this um, junction um, is, really, is really important to how we can promote all modes of, of transport. Um, uh, as well as expanding um, the, the lanes, um, introducing uh, two kind of crossing points, um, supporting people over there cycling, walking on public transport uh, and the like. It's worth also recognising that this particular junction is, is on a number of different transport corridors and so it is part of the, it is just one piece of the wider jigsaw. Um, it does uh, support the east-west movements um, from the Yet area across to the, 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 the North Fringe um, and the Cribs Patchway area, um, as well as being on the North-South uh, Metro bus uh, routes uh, linking um, Aztec West and Patchway all the way through to the city centre and down to South Bristol. Um, uh, critically important to supporting our, our future uh, economic growth um, and, and mitigating the impact that traffic congestion um, has uh, at, that, at that junction now. 
Um, I'm also really pleased to see the uh, investment being set out for the future mobility zone. Um, and again, recognising that is also uh, part of the wider jigsaw that we've already got underway, linking that with the umbrella um, test bed um, initiative and, and that, and that fibre connection um, between the and the science park, which, which does provide us with um, exciting new uh, technological opportunities. Um, um, uh, uh, and how we can then support the growth of our um, uh, digital economy, um, including through the Emerging Digital uh, Engineering Technology Institute, and, and, and this part of the, of the region continuing to play such a vital role um, in the future of innovation and, and, how we, and supporting the, the goals that we set out in our local industrial strategy. Tony, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to go around. So, Dina, any comments or thoughts, please? Yes, um, so obviously I, I welcome the investment, particularly in Bath and North East Somerset, but I also think that uh, what is really um, nice to see is that these are schemes across the whole of the Wecker region, and it's a range of different schemes as well, so investment, not only in transport, but also in skills and in land, and, and I think that, that um, shows what can be achieved when we all work together, um, and, and hopefully how we can, each region also sort of punch a little bit above its own weight in, in uh, perhaps addressing some of the challenges that face each region and collectively across the region as well. So I guess I, I very much welcome this investment. Dina, thank you. Marvin, any comments, please? Yes, a couple. Uh, first of all, really welcome the, the We Work For Everyone uh, support. Um, and we've talked about inclusive economic development. It's something that we've wrestled with um, from, from, from the beginning. But how do we make it real that we don't have the economy developing and then we just think retrospectively how well we've left thousands of people behind and how to do that. This is a big example of that um, being made real for supporting people with learning difficulties to have a, to have a piece of, of the, the economic uh, development that we have uh, coming through. And, and you, you think about the flip side of failing to do this, you've got the social isolation that can come back through being left behind by the economy, compounded by the learning difficulties as well. So um, the benefits of this are for those individuals, but it's also for all those other public services that begin to kick in when the model of development we pursue is one that produces bad social um, outcomes. I'd also, my, my cabinet member is really keen for me to point out, it was a, it was a fantastic uh, collaborative um, effort, both with uh, off, uh, combined authority uh, officers themselves, but also with um, with officers from our, our neighbouring authorities as well, so um, it's um, very, very positive. Also, just want to give my, also share my thanks as well on QTIP to Malcolm and, and the other combined officers, and obviously officers at Bristol City Council for bringing that to uh, bringing that to the stage. It's that uh, it's a hugely important uh, development for Bristol. Um, it's a catalytic development. And it's part of our city, and I'd say it's part of our regional brand as well. Um, I know not lots of work and lots of pressure has gone on, so I just want to make sure that people know we're very uh, thankful for that. Thank you, Marvin. Steve, is there anything like you'd like to add? No. Thank you very much. Um, I take the button and got the time there. I note that the voting arrangements are the same for all of the recommendations. Sarger is Charger is nodding in agreement, so I'll just write on that basis. So are members happy if we take all the recommendations on block? Thank you very much. In that case, please, may I ask you to indicate? I beg your pardon, sorry, as I've just been quite rightly reminded, with the, the addition of recommendation number 11, which I outlined earlier. So, members happy to indicate, please, if they are in favour of all of those recommendations, including the addition of number 11. Thank you. I note for the record that everybody is. Therefore, those are all agreed. Thank you very much indeed. That will take us neatly on to item 13, Professional Services Framework Procurement. Um, again, a huge amount of work has gone on in that particular paper, so thank you to all of the officers across the authorities who've been involved in that. I'd just like to really just stress the benefits to the region of this approach, and by having a Professional Services Framework contract, it's a very positive example of collaboration across the four West of England authorities. Sort of collaboration that sometimes doesn't get a lot of headlines and highlights, but it shows by how, how we can really 
work more effectively by working together. So this will, uh, given, you know, given our really significant uh, capital spend pipeline in the region, this framework will enable staff to work really swiftly and efficiently to access professional services contractors, reducing complexity of individual pro project procurement processes. So again, I'm very happy to, to move the recommendation. Can I please hold the look for a second there? For that, Toby, thank you very much. And Ms. Whether anything you'd like to add or comments you'd like to make on this particular piece? Thank you very much. Uh, I ask you then to indicate, please. I'm sorry, Mark, I'm going to beg No, please go. Um, it's just something that's been um, uh, raised, and just to, as we've talked about making sure that um, uh, climate emergency is reflected in what we do, but just one of those other standard things that we'd really love to see is that, uh, and this, um, is to make sure that social value is built in as well. We look at the numbers, but what are the, the, the wider issues that are coming out? We've done quite a bit, I imagine everyone has, but we've certainly done quite a bit of work in, in Bristol on this. Um, so I just appreciate that being noted. Thank you. And in that case, members, please would you indicate if you're in agreement with the recommendation. Uh, you know, for the record, that we all are. Thank you very much. In that case, we will now move on to item 14, the business plan fortitude progress report. Again, all those details have been shared, lots of work happens across all of the authorities um, and really important that everybody just appreciates that the business plan supports the delivery of the operating framework and sets out the key deliverables during the following year, 19, uh, 2019 to 20, for business still as housing and transport, as well as enabling our corporate activities. Uh, regular reporting on progress in delivery against the Business plan it is a key element of our overall performance management. I'm pleased that is something that an awful lot of work goes in across all of the authorities on a regular basis. Um, the report today is for information only, but very happy to invite any members if they have any comments to add, please. I note there aren't, so this is for noting, so we'll record that's noted. And again, my thanks to everybody involved. Item 15 is the report of the independent remuneration panel. Detailed papers have been circulated. Uh, the panel was asked to review member allowances in respect of the combined authorities' activities. In carrying out their review, the panel was guided by the following general principle. The panel would make recommendations that recognised and were consistent with the allowance schemes of the constituents' authorities. And the panel would take account of the financial and economic climate in doing so. Um, so, if there are, and again, lots of work's gone on cross-party with this and with the independent panel. Um, so, I'd just like to remind that uh, I will be, I will not be taking part in uh, voting on recommendation one. Toby will not be taking part in recommendation number two. Nonetheless, I'm very happy to move the recommendations if there is a second at least. Thank you, Dina. I beg your pardon. Sorry, what am I being reminded? Sorry. I beg your pardon. All number six. Thank you so much. I made a note of that. Glad you reminded me. So, on that basis, members, were there any comments you'd like to add, Dina? Yes. So, I'm sure there are several in this room who will know my, my feelings about capital allowances. I think there is a certain amount of unfairness that's built into uh, the system at the moment um, and we are somewhat unfortunate and this I think applies also to the, the mayor's um, remuneration too that we that these are not set nationally and um, in fact then we have to rely on a, an independent remuneration panel to uh, determine what is the, the right and proper allowance that should be paid um, and I think, you know, because we have to ask somebody to come and to assess us in either, you know, uh, the combined authority or in our local authorities, it is always a challenge because it always looks as though we are then asking for something for our, ourselves. And part of the reason sometimes around uh, having a proper and fair system of allowances should be about attracting the right people to those roles and to make sure that we then are able to represent uh, and be representative of the whole
all of our communities and not just of those that are in perhaps a more fortunate position to uh, serve in, in public office. So, um, you know, and it is always tricky because, as I said, there is this draw on the public purse to pay ourselves. But because I think that the role of councillors and of um, those who are in elected office is important, that is my main reason for supporting what the independent uh, remuneration panel has put forward. Dick Dino, thank you. Mom, any comments? Just to First of all, a bit of advice, just be careful on the way this is reported. I've got the stripes across my back, <laughs> just from uh, some wayward uh, reporting um, about increases in pay. But I agree with Dina. You know, this is, a, this is a debate I have often. Um, one of my brothers once posted, let's not pay politicians and see how quickly things change. I said, I'll tell you what happened. You'll only, you'll only end up with rich politicians because yes, they'll be the only people who will be able to afford to, uh, to do the job. Um, so there is a wider um, conversation that, 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 that there needs to be some kind of pushback. And I think sometimes people in office are nervous about having that conversation because by the time it's filtered through the pen and the typewriter and put back into the public domain, it's a nose in the trough that story. Uh, rather than how do we uh, make it possible for a wider range of people from a wider range of backgrounds to get involved in civic uh, leadership. Uh, and I, I've often shared the story of uh, friends of mine, um, two teachers, one wasn't teaching, they fostered children, and um, I said to her, I think you'd be a fantastic counsellor, um, and she would have been, she didn't want to do it for 20 years. I said, just, just make the boundary more poor, it's just do it for four years, come in, do your champion about education, kids in the care system, and then go back to life. Her words were to me was, I'd love to do it, but I can't afford it. <laughs> so we lost someone who would have been a phenomenal counsellor. Um, wasn't particularly uh, labour in that sense, he was any party, I just said, just get involved. Um, and we need to take that, that seriously. And, and, and I, so I, I, I support it because I think people involved in public life um, should get paid. But it would be interesting to see if there's any potential in the future to, to, to kind of help the conversation around this mature a little bit. Well, Marvin, thank you very much. So I was going to ask Steve if you've got any comments, but if you want to just come back quickly on that, go to Steve Dean. Yes, uh, obviously I completely support everything that, that Marvin said. I did have another question, though, which is in Recommendation 8, it says that uh, there will be a more detailed review currency soon, and I wondered whether or not uh, it would be possible to know what the... Assuming, uh, particularly because this um, particular uh, process had happened so quickly uh, that there wasn't time to have those conversations so, which would have happened between you know, the various members of the committee. So, Charlesy, I beg your pardon, thank you, Jane. May I just ask Charlesy to, to clarify that from the formal perspective? So, the Combined Authority Remuneration Panel is actually a combination of the Bristol Panel and the South Wales Panel, and we've asked for a meeting just before Christmas. So we're in the process of agreeing a date when the panel can, panels can meet together. Okay. And I'll come out in that as soon as I have that date. Thank you. Uh, Steve, I, I, I was smiling um, in reflection to, to Marlon's comments about our friends from the, from the, uh, from the journalistic <laughs> profession, of, of whom we've got some in, in the audience. So uh, very, clear, very warm and smiling. I wasn't attacking journalists. No, no, I, I, just just that's what I was. Just, <laughs> Mark, Mark, just to be our pain season too. I'm going to, to support, <laughs> just, just <laughs> make that point. I, I, I understand entirely the way your points were made, and I hope our colleagues from the profession appreciate that. Steve, any thoughts? Uh, a couple, Chair. These are incredibly important leadership roles, and our communities deserve the best leaders we can possibly find. We. All of today we have, I think, been thinking um, around the long-term future of our uh, place and there are some really big challenging decisions to be made and therefore our communities deserve the best, the best people that we can get to represent them and also the best people to help us solve problems. And because of that, given that we are in a marketplace trying to attract that talent, we have to recognise that um, that that commands a, a, an amount of remuneration that is fair, transparent, of course, always, and accountable. I think Marvin's point is right in terms of just making sure that we are enabling by ensuring that we pay a proper salary to those that have been 
uh, elected and then put into these leadership positions so that we don't uh, disadvantage people from coming forward because otherwise we will end up with a particular group always being the same group coming forward and that's really really important. Um, it applies to not just local uh, leaders and, and, and politicians but also national. It's the same thing. So my view is uh, that we should recognise the huge um, privilege for leaders but also the huge responsibilities and accountabilities that flow as a result of that. And we should also recognise that these are pretty uncertain roles because every four years or so we go through a process. And that in itself disadvantages some groups from even thinking about applying because of the volatility that might flow as a result of that. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. Um, um, Shall you just did tap me on the shoulder briefly regarding that uh, recommendation six in terms of voting? Can I ask you just from a formal legal perspective to clarify what you're always going to make? So, Chair, the West of England Finance <coughs> Authority order requires the Mayor or the Deputy Mayor to actually take part in each decision. Given that both yourself and the Deputy Mayor have an interest in this matter, this is one of the rare occasions that we would allow a dispensation so that you can actually take part in this, so that we can actually make a decision in this this particular regard. So for, for recommendation six, the mayor and the deputy mayor are allowed to vote in terms of back voting, otherwise we wouldn't be for it for that item. But thank you for clarifying that. Uh, so in that case, as I see things, we have eight recommendations. <coughs> what I would suggest doing with everybody's agreement is we take recommendation one separately, recommendation two separately, you know, different voting arrangements, then I understand that we have the same voting arrangements for the rest of the recommendations. Does that make sense to everybody? Good. So in that case, please, may I look for um, your, if you are in favour of recommendation number one to the three uh, leaders and mayors of the constituent councils, please. I note that everybody is. Thank you. Recommendation two. I'm entitled to vote in that, but Toby's declared an interest. So those of us that are eligible to vote, please, would you indicate if you're in favour of the recommendation? Again, I note for the record that we all are. And on that basis, given what I've just said, please, if we take items, recommendations three to eight on block, please, will you indicate if you are all in favour of those recommendations? I note for the record we all are. Thank you very much indeed. Toby. Uh, Tim, it was, it was just for the, for the record, I haven't commented on this item, but just to say I, I agree with, with uh, the comments of earlier committee members have had no new points to make myself. Th thank you for, for just raising that and clarifying that, and sorry if I missed, missed your wink wink a little earlier. Jolly good. In that case, please, that takes us to item 16, which is an information item. So whilst we draw this meeting to a close, please note the details of decisions taken at this meeting and the draft minutes of this meeting will be published on the Combined Authority website as soon as possible, as will the public statements submitted and the questions and replies. There being no more business to conduct, thank you all very much indeed for your attendance. Toby and Dave, please again thank all of your colleagues who have made us so welcome. And on that, I declare the meeting closed at the record or for Ian at <laughs> 11.23. Uh, there will be a 15 minute uh, break now before we start the next joint committee meeting. Thank you very much.